Um, compared to most other poets with as long a career as he has had, uh, Dennis Lee has published comparatively little. He is a slow and extremely careful writer. He is philosophically disposed to silence. Uh, if he has nothing to say, he will generally say nothing. And that has been my experience of him, both in print and in conversation. Uh, that is rare for any kind of writer. And it is rare still for poets. Leonard Cohen strikes me as a kind of another example of the same sort of thing, who also goes through long periods of silence. Lee also spends a great deal of time rewriting poems, including poems that he has already published. Uh, he gave an interview uh, just a couple of weeks ago on uh, CBC's Sunday edition with Michael Enright, and he was telling Michael that he, his, Lee's collected poems is currently in bookstores a new edition, and he was telling Michael that he has to restrain himself from going into the bookstores and actually scribbling corrections in the poems <laughs> that, are, that are in the stores. Um, he has given a great deal of his time that he could have been writing his own poetry to editing the work of other writers in this country, both in fiction and in poetry. A, a very partial list of those whose work Dennis Lee has been a substantial and silent part of would include uh, Margaret Atwood, Michael Andace, Irving Layton, Matt Cohen, uh, Don Coles, and Robert Bringhurst, among many others. And of course, he only looks like a, a poet who hasn't published much if you stay in the poetry section of the bookstore. If you go over to the children's section of the bookstore, you will discover another Dennis Lee, and that is the Dennis Lee that most people know, the author of Alligator Pie and some 20 other books of poetry for children. He said on Michael's show that he's the only poet he knows with eight-year-old groupies. Uh, his grandfathers were both ministers, and his parents were both school teachers. Dennis uh, Bainon Lee was born the last day of August in 1939. He grew up in Etobicoke, which was then a, a township uh, becoming a suburb. It had one high school. Uh, no library, no sidewalks, no trees on his street in his memory that were higher than a person because they had all been cut down to make way for one of the many new suburbs into which his family moved. Out their back window was just fields, as far as the eye could see. Everything was new there, he says. There was almost no sense of roots going back through the generations. It's odd to listen to the interview that Michael did with him, and Michael's trying to get Dennis to talk about Toronto at the time. And Michael clearly means downtown Toronto. And Dennis is trying to explain to him that, look, I really don't know, didn't know. Downtown Toronto to him at the time was exotic. It was somewhere else. He didn't know downtown. He didn't know Rosedale. His mother and father were both voracious readers. Uh, poetry came to him uh, as a kid, mostly through things like Mother Goose. He was an exceptional student, and his marks uh, won him admission to the University of Toronto Schools, which is, was and is a, a private school, uh, then just for boys, uh, at the corner of Bloor and Spadina. They told him that he had a future in math. He thought about going into the ministry, uh, maybe psychiatry, becoming a therapist. In his last year, his second to last year there, he had his first poem published in a book, uh, it was an anthology called First Flowering, a Selection of Prose and Poetry by the Youth of Canada. And the poem is called Free Verse, but it's actually a shot at free verse, at those poets who confuse the absence of rhyme and meter with profundity. Um, from the beginning, Lee was a poet who was deeply attracted, every bit as much as, say, for example, B.P. Nichol, to the sounds that poetry makes, the potential for sound in things like rhyme, meter, and cadence. On graduation from high school, he won the Prince of Wales Entrance Scholarship to the University of Toronto, which is awarded annually to the Ontario student with the highest average on any nine grade 12 papers, the papers that you then wrote to gain you admission into university. The massive prize was $50. Um, <laughs> grade 13, 
Grade 13. Grade 12 exam, grade 12 papers or grade 13? Okay, I stand corrected. Uh, like Margaret Atwood, he chose Victoria College, uh, the English Language and Literature Program. They were classmates. Um, she thinks that they met at a dance. He's pretty certain they would have met before then in a, in a class or something like that. By second year, this is 1958, they were working together on the Victoria College student paper called Acta Victoriana. And they wrote a series of uh, satirical pieces for the newspaper under the joint pseudonym Shakespeare Latweed, which is a sort of combination of their names with Shakespeare's name, and a name that after they left the college, other students took over. So there are pieces you have to be careful in Acta Victoriana that look as if they're by Dennis Lee and Margaret Atwood, but are actually by inheritors of the title. Lee took a third year off university to work as a volunteer for the United Nations in refugee camps in Germany. And when he had free time from that, he says that he wandered around Europe looking for his soul. He says that he saw it once. He was on a, a train platform in England, in London, but it got on the train and he missed it, and that was that. <laughs> so. He came home and he married a classmate at Vic. Uh, Donna Youngblood was her name. And one year later, he graduated with a BA and the Governor General's gold medal in English. After graduation, the couple spent a year in England. Um, Lee got a bit of work uh, doing research in the British Library for a Victoria College professor by the name of Jack Robson, working on an edition, I think, of Carla in the British Museum. And he also began working in the British Museum on the poems that would become his first book five years later. In 1963, they came back to Toronto, pardon me, yeah, 1963, and they had the first of their two children together, two girls. Dennis started a, a master's degree in English at Victoria College, and he got a lecturing job at Vic at the same time. They lived on Sussex Avenue, just north of us here, almost in the shadow of his old high school. About this time, uh, Lee and a few other young Toronto poets, writers, talked about establishing uh, their own press, uh, and given that there was so few others, a small poetry press. He and Margaret Atwood, who was then at Harvard, corresponded a bit about this, and he seems to have pitched the idea to McClellan and Stewart as well, perhaps as an imprint of some kind, but they politely declined. What did come out of it was a slim book of poetry that Lee ended up publishing himself under the name, um, the publisher's name, Muddy York Press. This is the first and only book that, that Muddy York Press ever published. Uh, Dennis paid for most of it himself with a little bit of money from Margaret Atwood and from Jay McPherson. It's called The Forms of Loss by Edward Lacey. Uh, Lacey Edward Lacey was a university college student uh, here at U of T, uh, precociously brilliant by all accounts, uh, eccentric by all accounts. There's, there's one story above of many that has him studying in one of the libraries here at U of T wearing a, a chunk of sod, a grass sod on his head with a sign on it that said, do not water the grass. Um, after graduation, uh, Lacey went to do graduate work at the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, that graduate work was interrupted either by uh, mental health problems or a minor drug offense or both. I'm not entirely certain. Lacey was gay, uh, and the forms of loss is generally considered to be the first uh, openly gay book of poetry uh, ever published in Canada. Lee claims not to have known that at the time. I find that rather difficult to believe. Having read the poems, they seem to me fairly obviously openly gay, but perhaps uh, he wasn't as attentive, I don't know. Um, Canada, and especially Toronto, was a little too Puritan for uh, Edward Lacey in the 1960s. He spent the next 15 years wandering around South America and the Caribbean, doing a bit of teaching, some tutoring. Uh, he wrote uh, poetry reviews that he sent back to Canadian little magazines, which to my mind are the, the best uh, poetry criticism published in Canada in the 1960s after Fry stopped doing it. They're incredibly smart, uh, well-written, uh, engaging reviews that very few people read. He published two more books of his own poetry, 
1991, uh, Lacey was run over by a car in Bangkok, and he suffered uh, irreparable brain damage from it and spent the rest of his life in care facilities and died here in Toronto in 1995. Lee spent uh, four years at Victoria College uh, doing graduate studies and lecturing. Um, he taught a course on Shakespeare. He taught a rare course on Canadian literature in his last year there. He co-edited with a professor uh, a high school anthology of poetry for Oxford University Press called An Anthology of Verse. He ran an informal creative writing group for students the, the, the poet Andrew Wainwright, J. Andrew Wainwright, who's now a professor at Dalhousie, remembers Dennis taking him and the other students over to the Bay Bloor pub to introduce them to some young poet that he met. It was uh, Margaret Atwood. Uh, this is Lee at about this time in an article in the Toronto Telegram about young academics. Um, I love how in these series they always say, you know, it's a young academic, please hold a book, look studious. Um, <laughs> he earned a, a master's degree for a thesis on Ezra Pound, but he decided not to go on with the PhD. Uh, he wanted to write full time. The year before this, uh, November of 1966, he had submitted his first grant application to the Canada Council uh, for a $3,000 bursary to write a novel about a Toronto medical student in the midst of a breakdown, according to the grant report. The grant never happened and neither did the novel. When I asked Dennis about it, he couldn't remember having written the grant application. He does mention in his papers working on a novel two years later, but again, there's nothing in his papers and I don't know what came of it. He won $3,000 from the Canada Council for the following year and $6,000 the year after that, which is part of the reason that he was able to quit his teaching job. He was also able to quit his teaching job because he got himself a new job that summer uh, the most difficult job that Dennis has ever had. In the summer of 1967, he became a resource person for the new Rochdale College. Um, today, uh, Rochdale is just another nondescript Toronto high-rise uh, on the south side of Bloor, just west of the Beta Shoe Museum. The only architectural distinction that I can see in the building is that it's set a bit further back from the street than most other buildings of its kind. That might be its last legacy of the, the public engagement ideals that Rochdale College began with. It began uh, the college with a very simple question, and it was Dennis Lee's question. How can we create an academy that we will respect? The building itself began not as a college, but as a cooperative residence for students at the University of Toronto, uh, Ryerson University, and the Ontario College of Art. The baby boomers were becoming university age in the 1960s, as I'm guessing some of you will remember. Um, and uh, between 1960 and 75, between 1960 and 1975, Canada opened 22 new universities to accommodate those students. Rochdale was part of that. It was built to be part of the need to not just educate students, but to house them. In July of 1966, a student-owned housing cooperative called Campus Cooperative Residences Incorporated got a $5 million mortgage from the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation to build an 18-story building for 850 residents. The main force behind Campus Co-op the guy who convinced the CMHC to give $5 million to a bunch of t teenagers um, was their 19-year-old general manager, Howard Adelman. The usual explanation for how it became a college, uh, for example, in the Star Weekly in January of 1968, is that students felt stifled uh, by universities, by traditional universities, and they wanted to make their own. In other words, that Rochdale was born of 60s idealism and counterculture and attempt to get away from what they then called the multiversity, the corporate multiversity. The Rochdale papers in Lee's archive uh, tell a different or perhaps just an additional story, and that is that Adelman added an educational component to the plan for the housing 
in order to qualify for substantial municipal tax grants, as well as uh, federal sales tax rebates on all the building materials that they used. Construction on the building began in the spring of 1967. While they were waiting for it to be built, um, Rochdale College operated for its first year, 67 to 68, in four old campus co-op houses here on the U of T campus. They took the name Rochdale from a town in England that was the birthplace of the modern cooperative movement. And in the fall of 1967, they simply declared Rochdale College to exist. It was never formally approved, despite what you may read in some sources, including Wikipedia. It was never formally approved as a province, as a school, I should say, by the province. Uh, it's very unlikely that it ever would have been, um, because Rochdale's doctrine was that there was no doctrine. This is uh, Dennis Lee. There is no degree, though members that can negotiate for one if they need it. No institutional curriculum, though members can give or take lectures, seminars, tutorials, make films, agitate on the streets, start construction firms or publishing houses, vegetate, no staff, though anyone can teach, no exams, so anyone can be examined if he can find an examiner, no entrance criteria, and no criteria for leaving. In the first year they operated, the college had maybe 30 uh, full-time members and another 100 or so part-time. Rochdale has often been called a, a free university. That is technically also not correct. In theory, uh, full-time student fees were $250 a year and $100 a year for part-time, though in practice I'm very doubtful that those fees were ever actually instituted or collected, but at least in theory it wasn't free. They had no regular faculty, just two resource people, uh, Dennis Lee and Ian McKenzie, uh, paid $10,000 a year with a grant from something called the Company of Young Canadians. The proposed seminar topics for 1967 to 68 included things like a course on Canadian literature and civilization taught by Dennis Lee and Dave Godfrey, a course called Nothingness taught by Dennis Lee, a course called Living in the Present taught by Dennis Duffy, courses on anarchism, classical, contemporary, human sexual development, normal and abnormal, and so on. The new building opened in September of 1968 the first floor housed a restaurant, which is what you see here, a bank, and the SCM, the Student Christian Movement Bookstore, which is now the Bob Miller Book Room on Bloor Street. Rooms ranged in the residences from uh, fully furnished ashram single rooms for $830 for the academic year. I think that's what we're seeing here, up to a two-bedroom, 1,100-square-foot apartment called a Zeus Suite. In between, there were Franz Kafka suites, uh, Aphrodite suites, and the Gnostic chambers. Um, people moved into the building almost floor by floor as it was being finished. When Stan Bevington moved into the building, he moved in the 17th floor, and the elevators hadn't been finished yet. Um, 850 residents, though almost all of them were not members of the college. The number of resource people went from 2 to 12, including Lee, uh, Anglican priest John A. McKenzie, the printer Stan Bevington, the First Nations activist Wilf Pelletier, and the actor and director Jim Gerard. They, uh, besides the courses that they taught, uh, dance classes, philosophy, that sort of thing, there was a cooperative daycare in the building called a Garden of Children, um, an institute for Indian studies, that is indigenous studies, a filmmaker's co-op with its own editing lab, and a community theater led by Jim Girard in the basement, what became Theater Pas Mirai. At Dennis Lee's invitation, Stan Bevington moved Cocho's Press into a garage in behind the building, and they became the in-house printer for Rochdale College. They taught printing classes for the college, probably the best education it ever provided. Uh, they also printed what was Rochdale's most popular product and its main moneymaker in these years, and these were parody degrees uh, that Rochdale, that Coach House and Stan printed, um, including using ink that they sprinkled with a, a, some sort of material that when put in an oven caused it to raise and thereby making it look like an official diploma 
Um, you could buy, there's a long list of them. You could buy a BA in Magical Apprenticeship for $25. Uh, I've seen a PhD in Poetic Justice for $100. Um, Stan himself uh, moved into the building, as I said. Matt Cohen uh, moved in as Stan's uh, roommate. Matt Cohen was also the first writer in residence at Rochdale College. Uh, he says, an appointment perfectly in tune with Rochdale's open-minded philosophy since I had published nothing. Uh, the American uh, speculative fiction writer and political activist Judy Merrill moved in. Victor Coleman moved in with his partner. Bookseller Nikki Drumbolas moved in. Unfortunately, many other people also moved in, um, often people who were not interested in the college or in paying rent. Um, in 1968, uh, the police were beginning to push the hippie crowd out of Yorkville. And a significant number of them simply moved down the street to Rochdale. Um, the drugs got more common, and they got hard, harder. And then a faction of what Victor Coleman remembers as redneck uh, draft dodgers moved in with their dogs, and then the runaways, and the drifters, and the bikers. By the end of 1968, Rochdale had become the best place in Toronto, maybe the best place in Canada to buy drugs, which was pretty much the opposite of what Dennis Lee had imagined it would become. This is Lee at Rochdale College in December of 1968, again photographed by the Toronto Telegram. In January, um, sorry, January 68, uh, this is December 67, the uh, College uh, Council held an emergency meeting. Um, they were concerned about the problem primarily of squatters, of people moving into the building that weren't paying rent. And they decided to ban squatters from all they could be was guests in private rooms. The ban didn't have much of an effect because many of the people who were moving in were simply moving into the rooms and then barring or chaining the doors behind them. Um, there wasn't, they, they had lost control effectively of the building. That spring at public meetings at Rochdale, tensions erupted between the campus co-op crowd, uh, the dwindling few like Dennis, who still clung to the idea of what Rochdale could become as a college, and those who represented whatever the place was becoming. In May, Victor Coleman circulated an apolitical manifesto objecting to Dennis Lee's prominence in press coverage about Rochdale. Lee was nearly 30 at the time. You have to remember, this is the time when you know, don't trust anyone over 30. And uh, Coleman and others thought that he was beginning to behave like, in Victor's word, their dad, and they didn't care for it. A few weeks later, Lee announced his resignation. By 1970, says the historian Brian Palmer, uh, Rochdale was, in his words, a paranoid shell of its former 1960s self. Its much vaunted freedom had to be protected by paid security force, composed in part by Vagabond's biker gang members. Police raids became routine, and violence was commonplace. In 1974, by which time the co-op itself was in receivership, residents broke up a security desk in the lobby and set fire to it on the street out front. Public pressure mounted to close the building down. On a May the 30th, 1975, police entered the building, and it evicted the last remaining residents and they welded the doors shut. It is now the Senator Kroll Apartments, um, subsidized housing owned by the Toronto Community Housing Corporation. All that's left of Rochdale is a bit of psychedelic art in the lobby that you have to sneak in to see, um, and a statue that's called the Unknown Student out front. Um, the statue was created in 1969 by Ed Apt and the Rochdale College Sculpture Shop. It originally, uh, the statue originally, as you can see in the black and white photograph, the statue was originally positioned so that the face of the unknown student faced the students in the building. And the idea was, the joke was, is that the back side of the statue is mooning the, the straight community. Somebody since then, I don't know who, has turned it around. Um, they were a bunch of kids and they were you know, trying to, to reinvent civilization. And they failed. Um, Lee was uh, 
and is deeply hurt uh, by what Rochdale, what happened to Rochdale. He says he, he still has difficulty walking by the place. Um, he wanted Rochdale to provide the intellectual community that the university he felt had failed to provide him, um, what he called the community of mutual ignorance. In 1968, he and Howard Adelman edited a collection of essays that, that see the modern university as more or less the servant of, of capitalist, liberal, uh, technocratic society and uh, largely irrelevant to what they believed constituted a real education. For myself, as an academic, uh, this is a depressing read. Um, it's interesting now, uh, less as ideas for reform, which is what it was originally written for, and then as a record of how much that the generation before mine uh, found disturbing that, that we now accept as completely normal. It's just the way business gets done. Um, things like business schools being part of a university. It was almost odd to me to read that once upon a time, students were concerned about that, that business schools are not part of the vocational schools, are not part of a university. Things like professors getting large research grants to travel the world. Uh, things like classes that have become too large to take advantage of what a university could be and should be. The other reason that Lee left Rochdale was that he had become extremely busy with another job, uh, one that he started the same year that he went to work at Rochdale, 1967. He had become a publisher, one half of the new publishing company that published the university game. The House of Anansi was founded by Dennis Lee and by another young lecturer at the University of Toronto, Dave Godfrey, who's a writer who was born in Winnipeg, uh, went to Trinity College here, and did his graduate work in the States. Like many other young Canadians of his time, uh, Godfrey had become extremely anti-American, uh, and he was upset in particular about the absence of Canadian books in Canadian bookstores. Um, if you walked into the prime real estate in the chapters today, I warrant he would have much the same feeling. He had, uh, at the same time that he ran into Lee, Lee had his first manuscript of poems ready, but he didn't have a publisher. They met at the Babelor Pub in Toronto. Six rounds of beer later, they had a publisher <laughs> themselves. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Their first home was in the basement of a house that Dave and his wife, Ellen Godfrey, rented from the University of Toronto at 671 Spadina, next door to a funeral home. They had $5,000, half of it borrowed from the bank, half their own money. In April of 1967, they printed 300 copies of their first book, which is Dennis Lee's first book, The Kingdom of Absence. Um, the publisher's name on this first edition, the first printing of the first edition is actually spelled House of Anance, an E on the end, as opposed to an I on the end. And it's commonly thought to be a typo. It wasn't a typo, it's just a variant spelling. Anansi is an African word, a West African god, and then they corrected it after the first one to what they realized was the more common English spelling of the name of this African word. The cover is by the Toronto painter Graham Cotry, uh, one of the artists associated with Av Isaac's gallery on Young Street. It's called Corner Figure. Lee uh, was a big fan of Cotri's work. And uh, it's Cotri or Cotri? It's Cotri, right? Coftri? I think you're right. Coftri, thank you. Um, he went to Isaac's gallery and said, I like his stuff. Do you have anything that I could use on the cover? And Av gave him a black and white photograph, um, which at the time, Lee didn't realize was black and white. That is, that the original was in color. This is not the same one, but it's from the same series. Um, but Lee liked the black and white better. He said it was more Kafka. Um, so Kingdom of Absence is uh, 43 untitled poems um, that all sort of fit together. In, in a preface to the book, Dave Godfrey called it a poem or a group of poems. So they all belong together, or they're long poem like that. They're all sonnets, all 14 lines. Lee said, in a 1972 interview, for five years I wrote almost nothing but sonnet variations. Isn't that absurd? 
the, the editor of Lee's new collection, um, Robert Bringhurst, says that the main subject of these poems is the, the moral and metaphysical emptiness at the heart of modern life, a kingdom of absence. In places, it reads like a kind of dry run for civil elegies, which I'll get into later. Lines like, Toronto the good is dead, and Revel's luminous towers, that is the Finnish architect, Villejo Revel, look down on Yankee heaven, chrome under smog. But the heart of the book is not in Toronto, it's in cottage country, where it begins and ends. Heedless by the pump at Schultz's weekends from the Pontiac, we would explode at carefree random, rinse Toronto from our helter-skelter limbs, and sprint like colts in the wind. Um, Lee's family spent summers at a kind of ramshackle cottage uh, in the Muskokas, um, just south of Gravenhurst. Harry Schultz and his wife Thelma ran a kind of fishing lodge nearby. In 1972, and again since then, Lee has called Kingdom of Absence a bad book. Um, he said that he hadn't yet found his voice. He hadn't yet learned to listen to what his own place was trying to tell him. They're not that bad, not really. Um, to me, it's just a young man's book that loves darkness and elegies because its author is at that time in a life when there's relatively little experience with real darkness and relatively little need for real elegies. In the fall of 1967, Lee and Godfrey got a grant from the Canada Council to help publish four more books. A reprint of Kingdom of Absence, which by then had sold out. A new edition of Margaret Atwood's The Circle Game, published originally by Contact Press, which had also sold out. And two new books. The first book of poems by a Hungarian immigrant to Toronto, George Jonas. And a book of short stories by Dave Godfrey called Death Goes Better with Coca-Cola. Over the next few years, Lee and others at Anansi published some of the biggest books of the can lead boom, including Graham Gibson's novel Five Legs, Northrop Fry's The Bush Garden, and Margaret Atwood's Survival. In 68-69, Godfrey had received a Canada Council grant, and he was spending the year in France uh, working on a novel, the novel that would become The New Ancestors. Uh, and what happened was that Lee got left pretty much in charge to run the place on his own and became the main editor of the press. He is an extremely careful and painstaking editor, as I can attest from firsthand experience. Uh, this is uh, Michael and Dace talking about what it's like to be edited by Dennis Lee. If something is bothering him about a section, he will write you a four-page single-space letter questioning you, questioning himself, questioning the universe, questioning the Liberal Party, God, early jazz violinists, plant life in Argentina, the immorality of Basho, the failure of the villain in the 20th century. This can be exhausting. <laughs> um, the letter that he wrote to Margaret Atwood, she sent him uh, Lady Oracle to read. I'm not sure if in an official capacity or not, but the letter that he wrote her back uh, starts with, my head is still whirling, and ends 10 single spaces later, two single space pages later. There are dozens of these letters in his papers, uh, both from his Anansi years and later uh, when he was an editor for Macmillan and uh, for McClellan and Stewart. Um, he's been sending me since, he, he read parts of my book before it was published, small parts, but then he read it afterwards, and I've been getting like editing suggestions from him, and I, Dennis, it's done, you know, <laughs> but <laughs> if there's ever a second edition, I have a wealth of amazing, and they're fantastic suggestions, they really are. Um, they all follow the same basic pattern, the letters I've read. There's an opening paragraph or two of effusive praise that tells you you're wonderful and your book is wonderful, and then the very careful suggestion that a good book could become a better book followed by 10 pages of complaints and confusions and corrections. <laughs> um, in April of 1968, Anansi published Lee's second book, uh, a long poem in seven parts called Civil Elegies. Uh, at about this time, this is very well known. The other piece 
that he published about this time is not very well known. Uh, it's a short prose piece in which he and a fictional friend ditch classes and hang out at Nathan Phillips Square. And Lee's character says in this story, it's sort of a story, sort of an essay, that as a white middle-class suburban Canadian, a wasp, he grew up with what he calls the total absence of the sacramental. That is that he was one of millions of Canadians who, because of their generic suburban landscape, grew up, in his mind, without landmarks, without a sense that there was a, a history there, a connection to the land in any way. There, of course, was, but much of it had been bulldozed over. That's another story. So he talks about coming downtown in the piece. He talks about what happens when the wasp leaves the nest, the suburban nest. When the wasp gets alienated from his suburb, he gets alienated from his whole sense of reality, see? And the whole question of civilization is suddenly reopened for him. He hunts everywhere, hence the landscape parables. He becomes a religious seeker. That is the motivation for civil elegies. It is a poem that tries to find or perhaps to make a sacred landmark in a secular age, to give some sort of um, spiritual basis uh, to, to a country that didn't, in his mind, yet have one. The poem is better known, of course, because of its title as an elegy for Canada. Not for any country that ever was, but for a country that might have been. It's a poem about failure. But it is also, and this is sometimes harder to see in it and easier to see in the later revisions of it, a hopeful poem. Um, it is a poem that sees Canada's failure to become what it might have been as cause for celebration as well as regret. Because without definition, Canada is always open to redefinition. That is, it is always capable of being reimagined by both current and future citizens. It's the same Canada that Northrop Fry saw in a series of essays and talks that he gave called The Modern Century. And that is a country that has an open mythology. In Fry's mind, America had a closed mythology. They knew what their story was. We didn't yet know what ours was. That's kind of the same story that Lee projects. The poem opens at high noon on a sunny eight, eight April day in Nathan Phillips Square, home to Toronto's recently opened and brand new City Hall. In the center of the square is Henry Moore's recently unveiled statue, The Archer, which is a problem for the poem because this is, of course, a British monument for a Canadian civic identity that didn't exist. Spectres, ghosts, haunt the square in the poem. They're ghosts from Canada's past. Failed rebels, uh, Indian swindlers, the ghost of Tom Thompson. Smog pollutes the air. The lakes are dying. From Queen Street, there's the flash of American chrome as cars drive by. From a little further away, there's the whiff of napalm in Vietnam. I'll just read you a short section of it. This is from the Fifth Elegy. The one section, the poem was composed in many different voices. This is one of the sections that sounds to me like a voice that's closest to Allen Ginsberg's howl. In a bad time, people, from an outpost of empire I write, bewildered, though on about living. It is to set down a nation's failure of nerve. I mean complicity, which is signified by the gaseous stain above us. For a man who fries the skin of kids with burning jelly is a criminal. Even though he loves children, he is a criminal. Even though his money pumps your oil, he is criminal. And though his programs infest the air you breathe, he is criminal. And though his honest quislings run your government, he is criminal. And though you do not love his enemies, he is criminal. And though you lose your job on his say-so, he is criminal. And though your country will found it without him, he is criminal. And although he has transformed the categories of your refusal by the pressure of his media, 
he is a criminal. And the consenting citizens of a minor and docile colony are cogs in a useful tool, though in no way necessary and scarcely criminal at all. And their leaders are honorable men, as, for example, Paul Martin. Paul Martin was uh, Lester Pearson's secretary for external affairs uh, during the Vietnam era. Stylistically, uh, Lee describes the civil elegies as his breakthrough book. It's the one in which he learned to get away from the very carefully controlled shorter lines and forms, the sonnets of his first book, and into these long, hurtling lines that look on the page like Whitman, um, but sound very little like Whitman, um, a new voice, a new style. Intellectually, the poem is a kind of mashup of Heidegger, Martin Heidegger's Metaphysics and uh, George Grant's uh, Political and Conservative Canadian Nationalism. Um, Grant was a, a political philosopher at the University of McMaster, hugely influential on Dennis Lee and many others of his generation. At the same time that Lee was writing civil elegies, he was also editing a collection of Grant's essays for the House of Anansi called Technology and Empire. But his best known book of the time, Grant's, was 1965's Lament for a Nation, um, which is a book that said essentially that Canada had become American in all but name. Um, Grant was a, a Christian, a devout Christian, and he says at the end of this book that he can't be certain that Canada's disappearance into America is a bad thing or not because it might be part of God's plan. Um, at times, and in some voices in civil elegies, Lee seems to want the same kind of consolation, um, the same kind of divine consolation. But the weight of the poem comes down on a worldview that is much closer to Heidegger uh, than to Christianity, um, that, that authentic being, really knowing who you are, both as an individual and as a citizen, happens here in this world. Um, and it needs to be found here in this world. Ultimately, the poem is about uh, how to make cities civil, uh, how to make them human, which is you know, obviously something that we're still trying to figure out. He edited an anthology of young Toronto poets for Anansi that came out later the same year as Civil Elegies, uh, 1968. Um, but between 68 and 71, he did not write a great deal uh, of his own. Um, he went largely silent in these years. He gave an interview in 72 in which he blamed the silence mostly on the, the work and the troubles at, at Rochdale and at, an, at, uh, at Anansi. Um, the same year, though, he gave a talk that has since become much better known than that interview uh, at a writer's conference in Quebec in which he attributed his writer's block to the silence of a colonial trying to speak about a country uh, that is not his own in, in a language that is not his own. That he, just, he just didn't have the words. He couldn't hear it yet. It's an essay called Cadence Country Silence, a pivotal document in Canadian literary history and cultural history. The words I knew in it, he says, in it, the words I knew said Britain, and they said America, but they did not say my home. His silence ended with a major revision to civil elegies that took him over a year. And the revised edition was published by Anansi in April of 1972. Uh, Margaret Atwell was on the board of Anansi by then, and she helped Lee put this together. The, the new design is by Hilary Norman. I assume it's an altered photograph of uh, the new city hall shot from below. That's what it looks like to me at any rate. Lee added two new elegies for a total of nine, and he made substantial changes throughout the poem. Um, he has described the first version of civil elegies as uh, stuck in one gear, said in one voice. He wanted multiple voices. He wanted it to be more of a conversation in which you heard different tones and different voices speaking. The result is not so much a different poem as it is the same poem by a different person, a little older, a little wiser, a little less sure of himself. The first one 
sounds at times like it's spoken through a bullhorn. This one's got other volumes. Um, the revised edition also has some new um, short poems, um, poems about himself, his marriage, his work at Rochdale and Nancy. I'll read you one of them. This is the first poem in the revised. It's called 400 Coming Home, and the 400 refers to Highway 400. You are on the highway, and the great light of noon comes over the asphalt, the graveled shoulders. You are on the highway. There is a kind of laughter. The cars pound south. Over your shoulder, the scrub grass, the fences, the fields wait patiently as though someone believed in them. The light has laid it upon them. One crow scrocks. The edges take care of themselves. There is no strain. You can almost hear it. You inhabit it. Back in the city, many things you once lived for are coming apart. Transistor rock still fills backyards. In the parks, young men do things to Hondas. There will be heat lightning, beer on the porches, goings on. That is not it. And you are still on the highway. There are no houses, no farms. Across the median, past the swish and thud of the northbound cars, beyond the opposite fences, the fields, the climbing escarpment, solitary in the bright eye of the sun, the birches dance, and they dance. They have their reasons. You do not know anything. Cicadas call now in the darkening, swollen air. There is dust in your nostrils, a kind of laughter. You are still on the highway. In November of 1972, uh, Lee resigned from Anansi. Uh, new people had come on board, and there were some very uh, ugly and complex power struggles, and he was tired and overworked. At about the same time, his marriage to Donna was ending. Uh, they separated in 72 and divorced in 1977. He won a senior grant from the Canada Council, and he got himself a one-year teaching position in the humanities at York University. On April 12th, 1973, the Canada Council wrote to Dennis Lee to congratulate him on winning the Governor General's Award for Poetry for your book, Lies. Dennis Lee never wrote a book called Lies. Um, John Newlove, who also won the book, the Governor General's Award that year for poetry, did write a book called Lies. Oops. Um, this is before cut and paste. Somebody just made a mistake. Um, in 1970, uh, New Press, which is the company that Dave Godfrey left and Nancy to found, published Lee's first children's book. It's called Wiggle to the Laundromat, and it was illustrated by Charles Pachter. The connection was made for them by Margaret Atwood. Wiggle to the Laundromat was first printed privately, uh, mimeographed in 67 or 68. He wrote it, his kids' poems originally, he wrote them for his kids. And the originals were just printed and circulated for his family and perhaps for friends and other families. The illustrations in this book were supposed to be in color. They're not. Halfway through, they realized they didn't have enough money to do it, so they came out black and white. Eleven of the poems from this were reprinted in Alligator Pie, um, including the title poem, Wiggle to the Laundromat. Alligator Pie was published in September of 1974 by the Macmillan Company, designed and illustrated by Frank Neufeld. Um, at about the same time as they published this, I think just a few weeks before, they published a companion book for older kids called Nicholas Nock and Other People. Wiggle the Blondabat and Nicholas Nock both did extremely well, but nothing compared to Alligator Pie. Um, if you go through his itineraries and his letters and his receipts and his papers, um, in 1974 alone, Lee did at least 76 readings uh, from Alligator Pie um, from places like right across the country, from the Creative Writing School at UBC to the Children's Library in St. John's. Um, he records there what he got paid for each one. One, one for Newfoundland says, $10, but a nice meal. You know? 
Um, <laughs> um, he got a lot of press coverage out of those readings. And he sold a lot of books um, then and since. This one has sold over a half million copies and counting. Um, a good part of its success, uh, then and now, a good part of the reason for its success is that it is an openly Canadian book uh, for Canadian children. Lee says, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, he says in a postscript at the back that when he read or was read nursery rhymes like Mother Goose to his kids, all the details in Mother Goose, things like uh, Jolly Millers and Pipers and Sixpence, those just, they weren't part of their landscape. So he decided that what he was going to do is that, in his words, Mother Goose, take up residence among hockey sticks and high rises um, in poems like a poem called In Kamloops. In Kamloops, I'll eat your boots. In the Gat Nose, I'll eat your toes. In Napanee, I'll eat your knee. In Winnipeg, I'll eat your leg. It's, it's a children's version of civil elegies. Um, the same complaint, the same solution. That is to write Canada into existence, to, to give it landmarks and use its language. He has written many other books of poems for children. Um, he also wrote the lyrics to the theme song for Jim Henson's Fraggle Rock and many other songs in the show. I've never asked him, I don't know for certain, but I would bet that he he was the one who introduced B.P. Nickel to the show and uh, for Nickel writing for them. He helped, he co-wrote the script for Labyrinth, um, Jim Henson's and George Lucas's 1986 musical fantasy starring David Bowie as the Go Goblin King. My own favorite of his books is a long poem called The Death of Harold Ledoux, which was published in a limited edition of just 500 copies by a small press in San Francisco um, in 1976. It is about a young writer from Trinidad who came to Canada in 1968. Uh, Dennis and the House of Nancy published uh, two of Harold Sonny Ledoux's novels, um, starting with No Pain Like This Body in 1972. One year after they published his first novel, Ledoux was murdered in Trinidad uh, during a trip home. He was only 28 years old, and when he died, he left behind the drafts of maybe 10 novels and the ideas for 40 or 50 more. Um, the, the poem, The Death of Harold Sonny Ledoux, is a, it's an elegy for Ledoux. It's also an elegy for Lee's years at Anansi um, and for the 60s, um, for what they believed in the 60s. He says in it, your dying uh, diminished the thing on earth we long to be. It's a very complicated poem. Emotionally, a very complicated poem. Uh, Lee says in it that Ledoux used him, but he also says that he uses Ledoux, that he used Ledoux. Uh, he doesn't really get into or explain why. Um, it might be the same way that I, you know, I use Ledoux, and that is the one uh, brown writer to start off a story about mostly white writers in Canada at the time, and that may have been what. Lee felt the sense in which that he used Ledoux. He loved him, uh, but it was an extremely complicated relationship. Of Lee's later books, I would single out in his adult books, Riffs, um, which is a collection of short poems about the end of one relationship and the start of another. There are improvisations around a theme. Um, Lee is a piano player, and these are poems that are inspired by jazz and by piano blues that try to replicate the effects of those musical coins on the page. In 2012, the House of Nancy published Testament, which is a reordered version of two previous books. Uh, one's called Un, and one's called Yes, No. These are poems, Testament, in which the earnest preacher from Civil Elegies comes together with the whimsical poet of Alligator Pie, the one who likes nonsense words. Um, they are extremely socially conscious, like civil elegies, but this time the elegy and the concern is not for Canada, it's for the planet. Um, these are environmental poems, environmentalist poems. <coughs> Excuse me. They're about the damage that we have done to the planet and to ourselves. They're lullabies to read while the forests die and the oceans dry up. It is not always an easy book to read or to understand. Um, 
The poems play around quite a bit with, with sound and with sense, and they use words from the more esoteric edges of the dictionary. Um, if children were the only survivors of an apocalypse and they had to recreate our language from scraps, this is kind of what it would sound like. Um, Mysteries of Tekka by Fixit, where did the world go? We named it, we tamed it, we gutted and framed it, and thar she be, cling clean with a soup song, a tis tisk. The breadcrumbs are gone and the story goes on. And how happily an ending. No next rise has shown us nor known. It's like, I don't know if this will make sense to you, but if Peter Pan's Lost Boys had read Heidegger, they would sound like this. Um, they're broken poems for a broken world. Um, Lee has received the Order of Canada and many awards uh, for his books. In 2001, he became the City of Toronto's first poet laureate. Uh, earlier this year, the publishing company that he founded published his collected poems designed and edited by the British Columbia poet uh, Robert Bringhurst. And I'll just end by reading you something that Bringhurst said about Lee in an earlier book about him uh, from 1982. Dennis Lee has driven his talent courageously and warily against the central vacuum of our botched and thoughtless culture. He is that rarest of things in our age, not merely a poet, but a poet who knows almost what poetry is for. Thank you.